Tonight's presenter, Mark Stewart, is an author and editor who has written extensively for the educational market, including six books on New Jersey. He is a longtime member of the Middletown Township Historical Society and is also a trustee of the Twin Lights Historical Society. He has been a popular speaker for our group throughout the years. So Mark, welcome, and I'm gonna pass it off to you now. All right, thanks, Tom. Welcome everyone, and thanks for logging on. Um, uh, I'm a big believer in the idea that the best way to create uh, kind of an intimate picture of a place is to get to know the people who made a difference there or had an impact there. And uh, I, I know that some of our local authors, Randy and Susan and Muriel and John and Rick, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some people, they've done a wonderful storytelling, a wonderful job storytelling using this method. And, and really, since it's not broke or ain't broke, uh, I'm not going to try and fix it. Uh, in fact, I thought maybe I'd try a new spin on it tonight and do some, um, I guess, Sandy Hook speed dating. We've all heard of speed dating, where you spend a couple of minutes with each person and then you move on. I thought that might be an interesting way of doing it rather than boring down on one uh, person or one topic to kind of spread out the, the love a little bit. So uh, I'm gonna keep this moving right along. And uh, as Tom said, I think as, as we go from person to person, probably the best way to do this is just to uh, tap in a question or a comment and then um, you know, we'll get to that when we're all done as opposed to stopping uh, between each one. Um, I'll present 20 individuals, some of whom you've heard of, uh, some of whom you haven't. Um, and I'm gonna explore their connection to the hook. Uh, I, I've tried to pick people the society hasn't done a deep dive on uh, yet, uh, at least since I've been a member. So uh, apologies to descendants of William Sandless and Penelope Stout, my wife included, and uh, other iconic persons you might have been expecting to hear about tonight. Um, I've structured the speed dating uh, list chronologically, and I've, I've kind of wedged it between two wars, the American Revolution, World War II. Obviously, uh, Sandy Hook has uh, always had uh, military importance, so a lot of the connections of these people are, are through the military, but not all of them. Um, I'll share my screen so you can see uh, who's up uh, and who's next. You can sort of read ahead a little bit. Uh, I think the best way to handle comments and questions, again, is, is maybe to type them out in the message window. So I'll try to power through these profiles in 30 minutes or 40 minutes, which will leave some time for discussion and comments at the end. I'll be really interested to see how we kind of pull this apart, you know, as we go. Um, I want to apologize in advance for any doorbells, phone calls, cat noise, dog noise, spouse noise, or any other interruptions as we've just moved and things are a little discombobulated. And we just bought a home that was part of the Underground Railroad, which is fun if you love history. However, it's also located near an overground railroad and freight trains occasionally rumble, uh, occasionally rumble through. Uh, and uh, I've noticed since we've moved here, the engineer takes that opportunity to practice his chin-ups on the horn. And I think I hear one coming as a matter of fact. So if that happens, I'll just stop until it passes. Uh, um, if anyone remembers the freight train scene from My Cousin Vinny, that's kind of the experience here. Can you hear it? Yeah, all right. Uh, I'll try and talk through it. Well, maybe not. I've never been someone who loves trains. I'm not sure if I'll, I'll become that person. I probably will be doing Ambien commercials pretty soon because some of these things come through early in the morning. All right. So let's get started and hopefully we'll, we'll have a quiet train ride here. Uh, for the record, uh, and this is not one of our 20 uh, speed daters, one of the first Europeans associated with Sandy Hook was someone named Estavo Gomez. He was a Portuguese explorer and map maker who began his career in Magellan's fleet. And in 1525, in the service of King Charles V, v uh, of Spain, uh, Gomez was poking around our local waters uh, for Northwest Passage. Uh, he appears to have established that the Navasink and Shrewsbury rivers were estuaries uh, that didn't lead anywhere. And more importantly for our purposes, he created a map of his journey that identifies the spit of land that we know as Sandy Hook and he called it Cabo de Arenas, Cape of Sand. So that's not where the name came from, I don't think, but it's interesting that even back then uh, that was the take people had on Sandy Hook. Okay. So let's get started. I hope you enjoy my choices and I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this works. 
All right. Uh, first up is Henry Clinton, uh, born 1730, died 1795. So the first bridge connecting Sandy Hook to the mainland was not a hartshorn project. Uh, the person responsible for its construction, uh, you could say, was Sir Henry Clinton, who was made commander in chief of North America, uh, British forces in 1778. Um, after France entered the war that year, Clinton was ordered to abandon Philadelphia and move his troops to New York City. Uh, and owing to a, la a lack of ships, um, he decided to march the army across New Jersey. Most of us know this story. Um, and uh, following the Battle of Monmouth, uh, Clinton encamped his troops in the hills around Sandy Hook Bay and ordered an enormous pontoon bridge to be constructed from Gravelly Point and Highlands uh, across to the Hook, which was under British control. And his army crossed uh, this pontoon bridge to the Hook and then was transported to New York by boat. Um, you know, and, and uh, from the city, Clinton directed England's campaign in the South, but his he had sort of a deteriorating relationship with General Cornwallis, which you know a lot of historians think contributed to the Redcoats' uh, ultimate defeat in Yorktown in 1782. Um, after the war in 1794, Clinton, who returned to England, obviously, um, he was appointed governor of Gibraltar, uh, but he passed away before he could assume the post. So that's our number one guy. Clinton. So this is how we're going to do this, just a little bit at a time, and, and we'll kind of muddle through. Uh, number two is uh, someone named James Moody, M-O-O-D-Y, born 1744, died 1809. Moody's an interesting guy. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He was a loyalist officer who was born in Little Egg Harbor, and he was stationed with the British forces on Sandy Hook. Part of the reason he joined uh, the British Army, the English uh, Army, uh, was that early in the Revolutionary War, he was working his farm when Patriot militia demanded that he renounce his allegiance to the Crown, and he wouldn't do it. Um, and when he refused, they attempted to detain him. There was a little bit of a gun battle, uh, but he managed to escape, and, and that's when he joined the Redcoats. So Moody became known for his dramatic rage and escapes and even more dramatic rescue missions. Um, there's one raid in particular uh, in June of 1779. Uh, he launched a raid into the rebel stronghold at Tinton Falls. Uh, the raiding party was very successful, it captured several officers, uh, destroyed a small arsenal of weapons and powder, and made off, most importantly probably, with several wagon loads of food and supply, uh, as well as horses and livestock. Moody orchestrated a really effective rear guard action starting in Fairhaven all the way back to the Shrewsbury River across from Seabright, if you're picturing where this is. And sorry, I'll get you a picture of Moody here. Apologies. There he is. Not a great picture, but. Um, um, so one of the ways that, that he was able to uh, uh, get his forces back was he used his prisoners as human shields. Uh, two of the Patriot officers, uh, Alk, Hendrickson, I think I got that name right, A-U-K-E, and Thomas Chadwick, they broke free as the booty was being loaded into a waiting ship, and both of them were shot dead at close range. Again, there was a gun battle, a lot of casualties, a lot of people killed, and finally, uh, it got really ugly, and a flag of truce was uh, struck, and the raiders sailed back to the hook with the militiamen, uh, while the militiamen uh, treated their dead and wounded. Um, he was sort of a swashbuckler, uh, James Moody. George Washington counted him among his most hated enemies. Couldn't stand this guy. He was constantly uh, getting under his skin. Um, and what's interesting, if, if, if you really want a good idea of what the revolution uh, in New Jersey was like on the ground, it was kind of a civil war, really. Uh, he did a post-war memoir that's really interesting. It paints a really vivid picture of the violent uh, conflicts between the Patriots and the Loyalists in the New Jersey colony. And uh, like many Loyalists, uh, including my wife's family, uh, he ended up in Canada after the war. Uh, and I think he ended up being a shipbuilder or something like that, I forget. Anyway, that's uh, James Moody. Number three, Titus Cornelius, born 1753, 
died 1780. A lot of people know him as Colonel Ty. I'm gonna get my notes here in front of me. Sorry about that. Um, he was an escaped slave from the Corleys family in Shrewsbury who commanded a band of loyalist guerrillas, Colonel Ty did, uh, from a base on uh, Sandy Hook. Uh, so again, he was known as Colonel Ty and he possessed uh, a really intimate knowledge of the Monmouth County countryside, which was highly valued by the British who were out there. Um, he led something called the Black Brigade. It goes under some other names, uh, which was the brainchild actually of Governor William Franklin, the loyalist son of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Cornelius and his men pretty much terrorized Monmouth County for a year, uh, plundering and burning the homes of slave owning families, uh, capturing militia leaders. And uh, as you can tell from his short life, uh, he, he met his demise uh, during one of these actions. It was uh, a result of, uh, I think, a hand or wrist injury uh, that became infected uh, during a raid in Colts Neck. And interestingly, the militia leader that Cornelius was attempting to capture was Joshua Huddy, who uh, we all know about. Um, uh, after his death, the Black Brigade continued to fight, uh, even to some degree past the surrender at Yorktown, uh, a lot in Monmouth County, a lot in Long Island. Um, and they were originally created as a labor uh, unit uh, until their effectiveness as guerrilla fighters was recognized. Uh, and towards the end of the war, they fought beside the Queens Rangers uh, for a time, essentially joining what was perhaps the world's most elite uh, commando force. So a really interesting guy. He was a scary guy too. Uh, he obviously taking things very personally. Um, Next up, number four, John Percival, Mad Jack Percival, 1779 to 1862. Um, Jack Percival was born in Cape Cod and left home as a teenager to become a merchant seaman. During this time, he was twice impressed, meaning he was taken off one ship uh, that was captured and put into service you know, against his will, first by the British Navy and then later by the Dutch Navy. And both times he made very uh, dramatic, daring escapes. Uh, he was, you know, he, he had a lot uh, on the ball. Uh, he returned from the sea, he married a Trenton girl and then rejoined the Navy uh, around the age of 30, just prior to the War of 1812. Uh, so at this point he's, you know, in his uh, uh, 30s. Um, uh, on July 4th, 1813, uh, and this is his, uh, his connection to Sandy Hook, Percival borrowed a commercial boat from a local fisherman in Sandy Hook Bay and hid 30 soldiers below deck. He ambushed and captured the uh, HMS Eagle, uh, unsuspecting ship that was anchored in the bay, and he sailed it into New York uh, to a hero's welcome. It was a huge uh, moment uh, locally uh, in the War of 1812. Um, so there were more thrilling victories against the Brits during the war. And then later, uh, 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 Percival commanded ships in the Caribbean and fought uh, successful battles against Caribbean pirates uh, in the 1830s. And eventually he became known as Mad Jack. Not sure exactly when that happened. Um, so you can see here, he's highly decorated, uh, he's older, and that's because he continued his naval career. In 1843 and 1844, he circumnavigated the globe in 495 days, covering more than uh, 52,000 nautical miles. And the ship that he captained around the world is still afloat, it's the USS Constitution. You don't think of that as, you think of that as sort of a local ship, that he sailed it around the world, so interesting guy. All right, another naval hero, number five. It's not a great picture, but I guess photography was in its uh, infancy at that point. Uh, this is uh, Matthew Perry, not the actor, the Commodore. Um, uh, best known as the Navy Admirable, uh, Admirable, a Admiral who um, sailed into Tokyo Bay, showed uh, uh, his show of force in the 1850s, convinced Japan to open its ports to American trade convinced them, he basically threatened them. Uh, earlier in his career, Perry was aware of the poor quality of American lighthouses. Uh, 
Uh, we know a lot about him at Twin Lights uh, because he was very involved. Uh, in 1838, he was asked by Congress to evaluate and purchase Fresnel lenses from France. Uh, so he sailed over there, he got them, he brought them back. Um, and these first lenses uh, were installed in the first iteration of the Twin Lights, which were unconnected uh, double lighthouses. Um, they were installed there in 1841. I think there was a first order lens in the South Tower, a second order lens in the North Tower. Um, and it dramatically improved the visibility and safety for ships entering New York Harbor. It was, uh, it was a game changer. It was also kind of a Kickstarter for the science of optics in the United States. People don't realize that, but the idea of bending light, of manipulating light really, you know, was not clearly understood. And, and the Fresnel lens really made uh, uh, an impact in that regard. Um, so anyway, those two items are pretty well known to historians in these parts. What is less known about Perry is that in the early 1840s, he remained in the area after uh, dropping off the lenses. He was operating out of Brooklyn, what, what is now the Navy Yard there. And he started the Navy's first gunnery school right off Sandy Hook. So uh, they were firing stuff long before the approving ground uh, was established there. All right, number six. It's a familiar name, but probably not a familiar face. Robert E. Lee, 1807, died 1870. Uh, famous Civil War general, um, obviously. Uh, while serving as a captain in the Army Corps of Engineers in the early 1850s, Lee, who was already recognized as a tactical genius at that point, designed a granite fort for Sandy Hook. Uh, he selected a two-tier irregular pentagon, pentagon design, sorry, with uh, more than 150 guns covering the water and uh, over three dozen protecting the fort's land approach. Uh, construction on, it was an unnamed fort and it was never named. It began in 1857 and continued more or less through the Civil War, but was never completed. Um, from 1867 to 1885, uh, it remained unfinished and, and, and basically untouched. Um, uh, Lee, of course, joined the Confederate cause in 1861. Um, and after the war, sections of the, the fort that he had started uh, were used to create Fort Hancock and the Sandy Hook Proving Ground. And I'm told a small wall section of Lee's fort is still standing. I've never seen it. I've never gotten anyone to show it. Maybe some of you have seen it. Interesting, though, you don't think of Sandy Hook and Robert E. Lee as, you know, being uh, connected in any way, but it was a pretty intimate connection. Um, next up, number seven, another military guy. Great picture, right? This is uh, Winfield Scott Hancock uh, with uh, three of his uh, aides there. Uh, born 1824, died 1886. Um, if you if you learned uh, New Jersey history in seventh grade or so, that's a name that might be familiar. And obviously uh, it's related to Sandy Hook with the Fort Hancock that's there. Uh, he was actually born outside Philadelphia um, and he was, uh, he, he was sort of a hero in the Mexican war and later uh, the leader of troops on Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg, which is where near where I am right now. Um, What's interesting about him, he was very dynamic and, and, and very persuasive. He was so effective as a recruiter and also as a quartermaster that he was constantly having to talk his way up to the front lines, no matter what, where the war was. Uh, the higher ups always felt he was more valuable organizing things and getting people to join up. He finally received his own uh, infantry brigade in the fall of 1861 and during the Peninsula Campaign uh, General McClellan uh, described his leadership as superb, and uh, that went out to all the newspapers. And from that day, of course, he was known, uh, you know, among the other uh, military guys as Superb Hancock. Uh, and the newspapers loved to have nicknames back then. They called him the Thunderbolt of the Army of the Potomac. So he was a pretty interesting, dynamic guy. Now, he was wounded in battle several times during his career in Mexico and during the Civil War, but always managed to recover. And, you know, recovering from a serious war wound was not an easy thing. A little bit of an infection uh, could do you in back then. Uh, 
a wound that he suffered at Gettysburg uh, did nag him the rest of his life. Uh, what happened was um, a bullet hit the pommel of his saddle and sent wood fragments and a nail into his thigh. So uh, that must have been a pretty icky surgery to do. And I think the story was when they pulled the nail out, he said, well, the Confederates must be running out of ammo if they're shooting nails at me at this point. Um, anyway, he became, uh, after the war, a major figure uh, during Reconstruction under um, President Andrew Johnson and in the West uh, later on under uh, uh, Ulysses Grant uh, when he was president. Um, and uh, he's an important figure in the late 19th century in New Jersey and to somewhat nationally. In 1880, um, Hancock, who, who was still beloved for his sense of duty and honor, actually ran for president of the United States against James Garfield. And he lost the popular vote by less than 40,000. Um, and interestingly, the only Northern state that voted for him was New Jersey. Um, so he lost uh, narrowly and as uh, corruption in Washington started to run rampant during the Gilded Age, uh, many Americans lamented you know, his defeat. They said, boy, things would have been much better for us if uh, you know, uh, he had won that election. Um, a lot of people asked, did he ever set foot on Sandy Hook where Fort Hancock was named in his memory? And uh, I, he did indeed, during the 1870s, he was in command of forces in the Northeast and was stationed on Governor's Island, so just 18 miles away. Unclear how much time he spent on Sandy Hook, but uh, um, it was during that period where nothing was being built. And obviously uh, when construction restarted, uh, he had passed away and uh, they named it in his honor. Anyway, a very popular hero, long forgotten, except for the fort that we now know on Sandy Hook. Uh, Number eight, this is sort of fascinating. A.G. Sinclair, 1826 to 1906. Uh, he's the guy in the hat with the beard standing near the cannon. And it turns out that was not a good place to be standing because uh, uh, Alan Gardner, A.G. was uh, stood for Alan Gardner. Uh, Sinclair was uh, the superintendent of the Sandy Hook Proving Ground in the 1880s. Uh, although he was not a military man, uh, Sinclair was known as one of the most proficient artillerists in the country. You see that uh, quote, uh, those words strung together quite often when you look, uh, when you, when you uh, research him. He was employed in the 1850s at the U.S. Arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts, and then transferred to New York City during the Civil War where he was in charge of ordnance that was shipped to the front. In other words, anything that went into battle had to you know, pass muster for him. After the war uh, at Sandy Hook uh, in 1886, Sinclair was overseeing the loading of a massive 610 pound shell. Um, and that's what we're looking at right now, or at least right before that. Uh, the powder ignited and two of the people in this picture were killed. Uh, Sinclair and seven other people were badly injured. One of the soldiers uh, in the newspaper was reported, they found no parts of him. He was just blown to atoms is the way they described it. Um, and it was a miracle that anyone survived in more ways than one um, because, because the exact position of each person was known when the shell exploded, the accident actually enabled audiologists to study the effects of concussive force on the human ear. I think I have, I think I, yeah. So you can see in this diagram here uh, where all the different people were stationed when the thing exploded. And the data from the Sandy Hook incident was published in, in a groundbreaking book called The Ear and Its Diseases. You know, not really a page turner, but it was an important uh, medical uh, text and um, it was written by Dr. Samuel Sexton. Um, anyhow, interesting, they, they sort of made lemonade out of lemons, I guess you could say. All right, another military guy. This guy's fascinating. Albert Meyer, 1828, born, died 1880. In 1859, right before the Civil War, anyone with a good spyglass trained on Sandy Hook uh, would have wondered who's that nut waving the flags. Uh, and, and it was this guy, Albert Meyer. Um, he was a military surgeon and a former telegraph operator who was obsessed with uh, 
creating a simple means of communicating across long distances uh, using flags and uh, torches. Um, in 1859, he had just convinced an army board, interestingly headed by Robert E. Lee, to approve his brainchild, the aerial telegraphy system that later became known as wigwag signaling, big with the Boy Scouts, if I'm not, I wasn't a Boy Scout, but I know that uh, usually rings a bell there. So these field tests that he was uh, conducting on Sandy Hook or between New York Harbor and the Hook in 1859 were a success. And the military, uh, which is tends to be slow moving on things like this, adopted the system almost immediately. Um, so you could say that, you know, Meyer was the father of the Army Signal Corps. A lot of people feel that way. Um, unfortunately, his right hand man in these wigwag experiments a man named Edward Alexander joined the Confederacy at the start of the Civil War and was actually the first to employ the signaling under fire uh, during the Battle of Bull Run uh, or Manassas uh, in the summer of 1861, which was a stunning victory by the South and it definitely played a role in that victory. Um, so there's sort of irony there. So after the war, Meyer turned his attention to storm prediction and he came up with several innovations that you know, in some respects laid the groundwork for the US Weather Bureau, a bureau, uh, the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and the World Meteorology, Meteoro Meteoro Meteorology Organization. Sorry, some tongue twisters there. Uh, fascinating guy. Again, a guy who ended up in kind of the dustbin of history. And that's, you know, that's why organizations like ours exist. So, you know, we learn about people like that. All right, I don't have a picture of the next person, but it's a great story, I think. His name was Dan Gillespie, born 1842, died 1911. Uh, Gillespie emigrated from Ireland at the age of 21 and he became a Sandy Hook pilot uh, in the 1870s. Uh, in, the, uh, in 1898, he boarded the Spanish man of war Vizcaya on a foggy February day and prepared to steer the vessel, which had a, a um, a 26 foot draft into New York Harbor. Uh, interestingly, there's actually, if you go to um, Library of Congress, uh, there's, a, there's actually video. There was a movie taking of this boat going into New York Harbor. It was, it was quite a thing uh, to have a Spanish warship go in there. While pausing off Sandy Hook, and this is kind of where it gets interesting, a tugboat pulls up beside the Vizcaya and alerts her crew that the USS Maine has just exploded in Havana Harbor. So although a state of war did not yet exist, um, as the only American on board, Gillespie found himself in, in kind of an uncomfortable uh, position. The Vizcaya's captain, uh, Antonio Ulate, assured him that Spain had nothing to do with the incident, and it turns out it didn't, uh, but expressed his concern about the reception he might receive when he anchored in New York. He was afraid that, that his boat was gonna be attacked. Um, meanwhile, as you can imagine, uh, alarmed by the timing of the Spanish warships appearance in local waters, the US Army ordered 200 artillery men and sharpshooters from the forts in the Narrows to Sandy Hook uh, the next day, which doubled the normal force at uh, Fort Hancock. Uh, fortunately, the Vizcaya came and went without incident. Uh, and of course, war was declared shortly thereafter. Uh, unfortunately for Captain Ulate, his ship was disabled during the Battle of Santiago in Cuba uh, on July 3rd that same year. Um, he ran the ship aground so his men could get off safely. The only problem was that the Cuban insurgents uh, were on the beaches shooting the sailors as they as they struggled, you know, up on the sand. So. Um, the Americans, you know, who dominated this battle were seeing this unfold and they thought that seemed unfair. So they sent uh, boats to scoop up all the, uh, uh, the crewmen from the Vizcaya who had jumped into the water, who didn't want to take their chances on the beach, uh, including Ulate, uh, who was taken aboard the Iowa. Uh, and uh, Captain Ulate watched his ship burn for a few minutes uh, and then saluted her and shouted, adios Vizcaya. And, as if on cue, the forward magazines exploded just as that moment. Uh, so it was made for a good war story. Two of the 
uh, five and a half inch naval guns uh, on the Vizcaya were later salvaged and they're actually on display at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. So interesting connection there. Um, okay, hope I'm not losing anyone here. 11 and 12, uh, George Houghton, 1850 to 1891. Actually, he's the guy on the right. And Frederick Stewart Church, 1842 to 1924. He's the fellow on the left. Uh, in the summer of 1879, Scribner's sent uh, Houghton to the Jersey Shore to write a story for its monthly magazine. He spent several days on Sandy Hook chronicling the people and the plants and the creatures that inhabited the hook. Uh, and he was accompanied by Frederick Stewart Church and illustrated, uh, who illustrated the article. Um, and a bound reprint of their collaboration is actually for sale in the Twin Lights Museum store. At least it was before it closed down from the pandemic. Hopefully they still have copies there. It's really sort of fascinating. Uh, Church, uh, again, the guy on the left was, was uh, already a leading artist in New York City and he was renowned for his depiction, uh, depictions of animals. He was a great uh, sketcher of, uh, of living things. Uh, Houghton later became a friend of William McDowell uh, and McDowell was the businessman who arranged the 1893 Liberty Pole celebration and the International uh, Naval Review at Twin Lights where the Pledge of Allegiance was given famously. Um, sadly for Houghton though, who was a fellow officer in the Sons of the American Revolution with McDowell, did not live to see it. He... Didn't expect that. Um, uh, he didn't live to see it. He passed away at age 41 from typhoid. Uh, you know, life was fragile back then. Um, now, along with the story that appeared in the uh, September 1879 uh, issue of Scribner's, uh, Houghton also authored a poem, uh, and I'll try and read it to you. Not my, not my strength here, uh, but it should ring familiar to anyone who's spent any kind of sort of quiet time out on Sandy Hook. Um, and here we go, my bad eyesight. Uh, White sand and cedars, cedars, sand. Lighthouses here and there, a strand strewn over the driftwood, tangled weeds, a squad of fish hawks poised above the nets, too anxious eyed to move. Flame flowering cactus, winged seeds that on a sea of sunshine lie unfanned, save by some butterfly. A sun now reddening toward the west and under the, under and through all one hears that mellow voice, old as the years, the waves low monotone of unrest. So wanes the summer afternoon in drowsy stillness and the moon appears. When sudden round about the wind cocks wheel, hoarse foghorns shout a warning and in gathering gloom against the sea's white anger loom, tall ship shapes of wreckers torch in hand, rattling their lifeboats down the sand. There you go. And hold your applause till after the uh, presentation. Anyway, next up, Susan will recognize this person. Uh, this is Ferdinand Fish, born 1851, uh, died 1826. Ferdinand Fish's talents range from construction to journalism to the law, and, and of course, he was one of the driving forces behind the building uh, and tourism boom in the Sandy Hook area in the late 1800s. Um, he developed much of what is now uh, what we call the Seabright, Seabright Strip, and he partnered with William Sandlist to promote Highland Beach on Sandy Hook. Fish was uh, also one of the founding investors of the Waterwich Park neighborhood that, that's now called Monmouth Hills, where I used to live. Uh, Fish made his initial fortune retrofitting old buildings in New York with modern conveniences, such as elevators and steam heating. You don't, you know, a lot of these buildings were not built with those things. Um, he also made a lot of money as a consultant for various railroad companies. I'm not sure exactly what he was consulting on, but uh, he, had a, he had a certain vision. Um, it tended to lean towards the grandiose, uh, but he did possess a, a pretty sophisticated and often kind of nuanced understanding of marketing and promotion at a time when those were kind of new ideas. Um, be that as, as it may, in the uh, uncertain economy of the 1890s, uh, 
it kind of took a toll on, on Fish and uh, he began focusing on smaller, more manageable projects like running apartment buildings and things like that in the early 1900s. And he later moved to um, Southern California where he passed away in his 70s. It was interesting trying to figure out what he did in his waning years. Uh, when you do the research, he tends to show up in odd places in where they're chasing down money and they're accusing him of taking it. So uh, kind of a wheeler dealer, I guess. Uh, next up, uh, the fellow up on top there with the, uh, with the hat, uh, his name is Travonian Patterson, 1859 to 1945. Uh, great story about him. In December, 1904, Captain Patterson and eight surfmen piled into an ice caked uh, rescue vessel that had been towed 40 miles by tugboat from Sandy Hook to save the crew of the British streamer, uh, steamer, I'm sorry, Dromelzier, I think it's pronounced, uh, which had run aground off Long Island. So his, they needed his expertise and his crew uh, in this horrible weather to save these poor people. You know, his boat was being, you know, tossed around uh, uh, in the surf. Um, timing the rescue between two boats uh, being tossed around in, in high frigid seas uh, or frigid high seas uh, was uh, incredibly dangerous uh, with no room for mistakes. And he was interviewed about it later. He, everyone was no, no injuries, no casualties, as far as I could tell. Um, he later said, we never think of death while in action but to say we never fear it is a lie, uh, pure and simple. I think it was, I think I was nearest to it then, but my honor was at stake and I either had to run the risk or be dishonored. So uh, tough guy, tough job. Uh, from 1869 to 1915, after which the life saving service was folded into the Coast Guard, a member of the Patterson family uh, was in charge of the Sandy Hook a life-saving station, the Sandy Hook Lighthouse, or both during that entire stretch. Um, uh, this fellow, Travonian Patterson, grew up on the hook and joined the family business as a um, teenage surfman in the late 1870s. His aunt, Sarah Johnson, tended the light for decades and later taught school at Fort Hancock. I think, I think, did you, did we do a presentation on her? It might have been another organization, I, I just don't remember, but uh, I believe she was the subject of a recent Zoom lecture, uh, which is why I'm only mentioning her in passing tonight. Uh, she taught school out on the hook until 1898 when you know there was this big panic about war with Spain and she was evacuated with all the other women who were on the boat on the base. And uh, so the Patterson family could do a whole book on them. And, and I, know, uh, I know there's been quite a bit written about them. Um, Here's a familiar face to silent movie fans. Uh, Tom Mix, born 1880, died 1940. <clears throat> uh, Tom Mix, if you don't know, was kind of the clean cut star of hundreds of Westerns, uh, bridging, he kind of bridged the silent era and into the early days of uh, talking pictures. Uh, prior to his movie career, around the start of the Spanish American War, he was stationed at Fort Hancock on Sandy Hook. He had joined the army as a teenager um, and his name was really Tom Mix. Um, his unit uh, was never deployed, but he was considered AWOL in, 1990, in 1902 after failing to return from a furlough during which he married his first wife. There's no record that I could find of a court martial or a discharge, he was never arrested. It just, he just kind of went into the wind. And I'm sure that happened with a lot of people there, you know, after the war was over. But, you know, he became a big movie star. So that was something they had to clean up a little bit. Uh, so he went AWOL in 1902. Uh, three years later, Mix was among 50 horsemen who rode with a man named Seth Bullock in Teddy Roosevelt's inauguration parade. So somewhere in those three years, uh, he obviously gained a reputation that, that he had not earned you know, while in the military. Uh, Bullock, if that's a familiar name, he was a cavalry officer during the Spanish-American War and the main character in an HBO series called Deadwood. Um, 
which was based on uh, his real life experience after the war, or actually before the war, sorry. Um, so when Mix became a movie star, the Hollywood publicists had to kind of clean it up and they used his association with this guy, Seth Bullock, uh, to conflate their relationship uh, uh, and turn Mix into you know, one of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders, which just wasn't true. You know, he was just, you know, he was, he was at Sandy Hook basically while the war was being fought. Um, he did, however, become an expert horseman and a crack shot. And this is what paved his way into the movies probably around 1910 or 1911. Um, he was signed by one of the first uh, studios, I think it was the Selig studio, the first uh, movie studio to uh, relocate to Los Angeles. Um, so he was right there at the beginning. And I think Howard Lloyd was with him too. Um, here he is shown in a 1926 movie, and I think it was called No Man's Gold. He made well over a hundred films, maybe even 200. Um, Tom Mix. All right. <clears throat> George Gould, number 16, uh, born uh, 1881, died 1944. In 1895, uh, Gould was hired as a teenage messenger by Western Union and grew up to be the company's marine observer at Sandy Hook. He spent much of his adult life purchased, uh, perched atop uh, an 88 foot shingle tower near the end of the hook, uh, not the lighthouse, a different structure. And, and there he was often accompanied by a Coast Guardsman. Uh, he used a famously a five foot long old time telescope, which we see here in this uh, newspaper picture to log vessels coming and going and reported uh, them to customs officials, uh, insurance companies, newspapers, hotels, post offices, anyone who had an interest in ships coming or, or leaving uh, the harbor. Um, Gould uh, had an eight hour day shift. Uh, he worked seven days a week. Uh, he got three weeks vacation each year uh, and was employed by Western Union for 48 years. Uh, he lived on First Avenue in Atlantic Highlands. Um, and it was said that uh, he could identify ships uh, from ocean liners to um, tramp steamers uh, by their silhouettes alone. So he was, uh, I guess he had an eidetic memory or something. Um, next up, Nell Kenny, great story. It is a commonly held belief in these parts that Gertrude Ederly, of whom I'm a great fan, uh, was the first woman to swim from the Battery in Lower Manhattan to Sandy Hook. Truth is that someone else did it at that more than a decade earlier. On September uh, 20th, 1914, 27-year-old Nell Kenny of Australia became the first woman to complete the swim from the Battery to the Hook. It took her nine and a half hours. Uh, Kenny had been training that summer in England hoping to become the first woman to swim the English Channel, but World War I broke out, so that was off. Um, so she sailed to the US and arrived in New York and offered $5,000 to anyone who could beat her in an open sea race, is what they used to call them, and found no takers. She had a reputation as being unbeatable. Um, she was called the queen of the surf, and on this trip to the US, she was accompanied by uh, a British trick driver named Walter Tong. And her promoter was named Jumbo Ecclestone. Jumbo Ecclestone billed himself at 450 pounds as the world's heaviest swimmer. So it must have, they must have been quite an entourage walking around the ship and walking around New York. Uh, so she couldn't find any takers for the $5,000 uh, bet. Um, and she just wanted some publicity. I think she wanted to be in the movies or something. So she's stuck in New York now. The war is going on in Europe. Uh, uh, Australia is a very long way away. So she figures, okay, I'm going to make some money here. So she uh, agrees to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge for Universal Animated Pictures, which is going to pay her, you know, thousands of dollars. Uh, so she got to the bridge and before she could jump off, she was arrested <laughs> and asked to leave the country. <laughs> apparently, apparently she was a big pain in the ass. Um, 
I tried to figure out what happened to her after she was deported. Uh, I kind of lost track of her uh, after she returned to Australia, but you know, I hope she lived a long and, and happy life and stayed away from big bridges. Um, number 18, Morris Goodkind, born 1888, died 1968. He's got an interesting connection to Sandy Hook. If you do much driving around New Jersey, you'll notice that a lot of bridges have kind of a similar look and feel, especially ones from the 30s and the 40s. We have this uh, gentleman, Morris Goodkind, to thank for that. He was one of the country's most admired bridge designers, uh, specifically for blending aesthetics and functionality into, into the spans that he created. Um, after working in the New York subway system in the World War I era, he moved to New Jersey and uh, became the state's chief uh, bridge engineer in 1925, I think. Um, Goodkind held that position for, position for 30 years, uh, during which he designed the bridge from Highlands to uh, Sandy Hook, uh, the Rumson Seabright Bridge, which still stands, and the Oceanic Bridge, which is uh, looks like it's going to come down pretty soon. Uh, and if you think about it, they all had sort of the same look and feel. So this is why this is the man responsible for it. Uh, Goodkind was also the key advisor on the Pulaski Skyway. And he, he designed uh, what they call the College Bridge uh, over the Raritan River in New Brunswick, um, which I just drove past recently. It really is one of the most beautiful concrete bridges I've ever seen, so uh, along with the Oceanic Bridge. Um, so Morris Goodkind. Home stretch, number 19, Nancy Carroll, born 1903 died 1965. Some of you may remember her. Um, one of the big logistical challenges at the start of World War II was arranging for uh, big name entertainers to amuse the troops and keep their morale high. Uh, it, was, it was not a successful part of the war and you know, young guys were pretty nervous about stuff. So they had to keep them distracted. And here's a very distracting uh, actress. Uh, she was really the first movie star, well, she was the first movie star for sure to entertain uh, soldiers at Fort Hancock uh, during World War II. And if you go back to the base newspaper, which you can find in some, uh, probably newspapers.com or something, uh, you can see it was a memorable visit. She was there for three days uh, at the base in the summer of 19, early summer of 1942. And she was performing Mr. and Mrs. North, a play about a husband and wife detective team. And I think some of the guys on the base were in the, in the play as well. Um, during uh, Carol's uh, stay, the soldiers named a, rear, uh, a rail artillery cannon in her honor, and she christened it with a bottle of champagne. I couldn't find a good color picture of her, but um, she was really, you know, she was every bit as, as, as appealing as, as this black and white photo shows. Uh, she was, and she could act. She was, uh, uh, in 1930, she was an Oscar nominee uh, for Best Actress and really was an A-list actress at the end of the silent era and then in the early 30s uh, when the talkies came in. Um, her trademark was red hair and, uh, and obviously a playful smile. Uh, and that made her kind of instantly recognizable even as she aged out of sort of the ingenue roles and moved uh, onto the stage. And then finally into television in the 1950s. So she had a very long 30, 40 year business, uh, show business career. And she received a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame in 1960. So good for her. All right, number 20. I think I'm keeping on schedule here. Elizabeth Evans, 1912 to 1993. This is the best picture I could find of her, but it's an important picture because of those patches that you see. I'll explain them in a minute. Uh, she was a graduate of Vassar and worked as the post librarian at Fort Hancock during World War II. <clears throat> uh, she arrived in the spring of 1941 before the war began. And uh, in 1943, she became part of the newly formed Army Hostess and Librarian Services. Uh, she was a real curiosity on the base because she wore a military uniform and ate with the officers, but did not have an official rank. Also, she could enter and leave Fort Hancock without a pass, which made her probably the envy of every enlisted man. Um, on her shoulder, 
uh, and on her hat, uh, Evans wore uh, what at that time was a new patch that featured a semicircle and it contained 10 different colors, one for each branch of the US Army, um, meaning she could claim membership technically in the medical, artillery, signal corps, uh, the infantry, the cavalry. Technically, uh, she was part of all of them. Soldiers on the base joked that she was part of the Rainbow Division. Again, it's too bad I couldn't find a good color picture of her. Um, so she, she oversaw, Evans oversaw the creation of a new fort library with more than 10,000 books and periodicals. Um, and she used her publishing contacts in New York City to obtain review copies of new books which enabled the soldiers to read future bestsellers at the same time the reviewers did months before the public could get their hands on them. So she was really, she had a lot on the ball. Um, after the war, she uh, married uh, a man named Francis Mich uh, Michler and uh, moved to Boston and lived a long and fun life. Okay, I'm gonna give you one bonus because I couldn't figure out where to put him. This is John Williams Gunnison, 1812 to 1853. Uh, clothing optional, Gunnison Beach takes its name from nearby Battery Gunnison, uh, which was constructed in 1902, I believe, at Fort Hancock. Uh, John Gunnison, uh, the man after whom the battery was named, graduated number two in his class at West Point in 1837 and distinguished himself as a leader of military, military exploration parties. Uh, in Florida, uh, in the Great Lakes region, um, and then later in the American West. In 1853, 40-year-old uh, Gunnison uh, was ordered to survey potential routes for the Transcontinental Railroad through the Rocky Mountains. And during that uh, work, his party was uh, massacred by Ute warriors in Utah territory. Interestingly, rumors persisted that the attack might have been secretly orchestrated by Brigham Young, uh, who had, was establishing, you know, the Mormons out there. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, in 1855, an army investigation officially cleared Young and the Mormons of any involvement, but there's always sort of a lingering, you know, question whether they were dressed up as Indians or whatever anyway. Um, that is, that is it. That's that's what I've got. All right, Mark. Thank you very much. That was that was nice. Good All right. job. Tried to power through it for you guys. <laughs> uh, we do have some questions coming in, and if you have a yeah. question, please get it into the chat. We'll uh, we'll ask Mark. So uh, I'll start with one. Just want to know, how did you find some of these people? Well, we when when COVID hit and the lighthouse closed down, uh, we wanted to find a way to uh, use. Uh, the the uh, the twin lights is kind of a rallying point for people who you know all of a sudden were allowed weren't allowed to physically interact with other people. We thought, well, let's tell some stories and let's you know look at some pictures and and find some interesting people who were attached to the twin lights and and Sandy Hook and this whole area, and just tell their stories uh, and try and get people saying, oh, I remember this guy or my grandmother knew that guy and or wow, I never knew that. That's incredible and and, and it was really, really effective. It, it created an, an interesting sort of uh, social media community. Um, and originally it was supposed to last for a month, but you know, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of got on a roll and you know, uh, uh, just researching uh, old newspapers and, and, uh, and you know, setting up your Google searches to do things in interesting ways came up with really interesting people. Obviously, most of them were not involved with Sandy Hook, probably about 50 of them were. So this 20 is called down from about 50. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, bootleggers, uh, uh, mobsters, uh, a lot of athletes. Uh, Atlantic Highlands, by the way, not this, you know, it was not a Middletown connection, had a huge sports, uh, because it was uh, sort of a biracial town, it had a huge, it was like a sports powerhouse um, on the high school level and also on the semi-pro level. So I really uncovered a lot of really interesting things. Um, so that's my long answer to your short question. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from an attendee. He wanted to know the name of Moody's book that you talked about. 
Uh, oh gosh, what was it called? Uh, I don't have it here, but that's something you can definitely Google. Okay. I, I read some expert. I, I read some excerpts of it. You can find them online. I never did find the whole thing online though. The poem that you recited is that available anywhere online? I got it. I think I got it out of the 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 the, uh, the reprinted article. I'm sure it is online. Uh, but I just don't know what the name of it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. You know the the problem of 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 of, of trying to digest you know, 20 full stories and then crush them down very small as you almost force yourself to forget some stuff or leave some stuff in another file. So I apologize for that. Uh, that was probably the flaw in, in this presentation, but hopefully I can give some better answers. So please continue. <laughs> another question we had is, what was the full name of that actress that you spoke about? Nancy Carroll. That's it, okay. We had somebody who must have missed it during the presentation. Nancy Carroll and she was kind of, uh, she was, you know, a lot of the people, a lot of the entertainers who came to Fort Hancock were uh, from Broadway. So she had transitioned from movies to a stage at that point. Um, uh, a lot of, some of the people who didn't make the cut, so to speak, were um, uh, athletes who were stationed on the base, who were then made the coach of the baseball team or the football team. And they used their connections to bring the Yankees and the Giants and the Dodgers to, to play games uh, uh, against the base teams. And, you know, there were a couple of close ones, a lot of blowouts, but a lot of close ones too. Um, uh, also, there were, uh, there was a very famous opera singer who used to come to the base. Uh, whenever the base would uh, get an enlisted guy going through there for training, who was an operatic singer, they would notify her and then she would she would come and perform and include them in the performance. So um, it was interesting. The proximity to New York uh, uh, turned out to be, you know, really good. You know, uh, uh, they took really good advantage of that. Elizabeth Evans is a perfect example. She had publishing connections, so she was getting review copies of books. I mean, imagine, you know, being, you know, coming to, uh, you know, train at an army base from some you know, far off part of the United States and being handed, you know, a review copy of, of the next great book. It's kind of interesting. They really did take care of their people there. Do you happen to know any of the movies that Nancy Carroll was in? Uh, I don't. I don't even know the one that she was nominated for. Not off the top of my head. Okay. Sorry. That can be found at IMDb easily by anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Mark, is there anything else you wanted to go over? No, I tried to keep it an hour. It looks like we hit it right on the, the nose here. Um, I just want to thank everyone for, you know, logging on, tuning in. And um, uh, what I'll do is I'll send uh, Tom a list of these people. Uh, and he can put it on the website or on Facebook. And that way, if there's anyone who sort of caught your attention, you want to know more about, you have the names, you can go right there. So that's oh, that'd be great. great. Yeah, we'll definitely put that out there. Okay. So once again, thank you, Mark, for doing this. And thank you to everybody for attending. For additional info on the Middletown Township Historical Society, please visit us at middletownnjhistory.org. We hope to see you again next month. Good night, everybody.